Conti, bella palla per Rebic, Rebic Ibra, Rebic, 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 il tiro, Goal! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Fisher, joined by the mole rat Anthony Torgrud. What's up guys, happy to be here. Um, moving on quickly, what's up John? Yeah, hiya, good to be back next <laughs> week. Um, it's nice to be talking after a win. We're uh, we're in a bit of a giddy mood this evening, lads, because um, obviously we record on Sunday nights and we've just seen Milan beat Roma 2-1. Huge, huge win in the magnitude of the season, um, in the magnitude, uh, you know, with regards to how results have gone for us recently and the mini crisis that we've had, if you want to call it that. Um, so we're, we're buzzing. You know, we've answered um, the critics in many respects with a good performance. Uh, but before we come on to that, and I know we're dying to talk about that because we've just seen it, uh, but we do have another game to review. Um, we're into the Europa League last 16. Um, after we scored two away goals in Belgrade, yes, it was disappointing to give up the last minute equaliser and stuff. Thought it would be a routine job at home. Obviously, back at San Siro, picked probably um, a half strength team, it would be fair to say, with a few rotations. Uh, it, it wasn't easy by any means. No, it wasn't. And, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but Today, I was having flashbacks of that game after we had the, the two callback goals in the opening nine minutes or however quick it was. But um, just to get back on topic, that, that Red Star game was extremely difficult. It was much harder than it needed to be. Um, and it wasn't for, you know, starting our substitutes or anything. Like, we, we fielded a, a strong team for the most part. We were definitely playing to win. And we didn't need an extra goal, but we pushed for it. And it kept putting us in danger. So... It was, as a fan, a really frustrating and scary game to watch. Mm. Yeah, for me, it, parts of it was disappointing, but other parts I wasn't too like mad at. We created enough chances over the two legs to secure the victory. It came, like their goal came from just another sloppy defensive error once again. But I know we'll get onto that, but I'm not overly mad really. I mean, we were talking since probably. The draw was announced in, was it like December, how tough of a opposition Red Star were going to be. And we were kind of building it up. So in our heads, I think we expected an easy run, but I think we knew deep down it wasn't going to be straightforward, a uh, real like, steamrolling performance that we weren't expecting. Because they are a good side. like They are top of the, the Serbian First Division, whatever, yeah. for a reason. Yeah, they are. And we talked about it with the draw, as you said, and you also... Um, put out an interesting tweet that I fully agreed with. It's like, we've been warned by our own fan base that Red Star are so dominant domestically. You know, I've said it on this podcast. They've, I think they're now on 20 league wins out of 22 uh, and they've only conceded nine goals all season or something daft like that. Um, so they're dominant domestically. That obviously translates into confidence, especially in a tie like this where they're not expected to win. So anything other than a comfortable defeat is a success for them. Um, obviously, Stankovic gives them an extra, an extra sort of intangible wild card factor because he really wanted to beat us. Um, I mean, I said after the first leg, like, I wasn't massively impressed by any of their individuals, and uh, I stand by that. Aside from uh, the guy who scored the equaliser at San Siro, um, I, I think, I mean, he's thirty-one. Um, you wouldn't have been able to tell because he had bags and bags of pace. And he had Ron Manuelli running scared for that equalising goal. But um, I think they're just a unit that works incredibly hard. They have a system that works for them. Uh, they have a game plan that works for them. They're very physical. Uh, they don't give you an awful lot of time. It was probably a difficult opponent for us to play, given the time that we're going through at the moment as well. And I think that's why it translated into quite a tough 180 minutes over the two legs to watch for us. Um, we we, fair, we played into their hands in some respects and then in others we did enough definitely to, to get through. We had disallowed goals. Um, we, we missed chances that we wouldn't miss on other days without a doubt. The most important thing is just whatever way it takes, get into the next round um, because the last thing we needed was to mess up that second leg and have the media storm be even worse than what it had been in the build-up to that. Um, there wasn't really too many incredible performances to pick out. I think Kessier was probably the man of the match for me. But again, I was worried that, and we'll come on to the Roma game, um, he does so much on his own that eventually he ain't going to be able to keep keep doing that. 
Um, but the, aside from that, clutching at straws a little bit, really. I mean, Liao was given a chance at centre forward um, with Mandzukic injured, injured and Ibra rested. He was pretty anonymous, to be honest. I didn't think Krunic had a bad game again. Um, but then, yeah, the others, it's pretty slim pickings. Uh, but Tamori did enough in what we saw to displace Romagnoli. And again, we'll come on to that decision. But yeah, um, and then Man United. How do you feel? That's the one team I didn't want. I think they're really? the favorites to win the, the whole competition. Um, although you look at today's results, you know, they played Chelsea, a very boring 0-0 game. Ironically, three former United players scored for Inter today. And then Tomori had a great game for us as well. But uh, they didn't look good today. So maybe that form continues into our fixture. But I, I think it's going to be a tough one. I think that's the hardest fixture we could have drawn. I think, in a way, it is one of the harder fixtures that we could have drawn. But to to win a competition like that, you've got to be the best. And they are one of the best in the competition. And it's going to be such a good reference point to see where we're actually at with the squad. Like, we're playing, this is a Champions League tie in effect. And yeah. they're going to be in the Champions League next season. So it's going to be a good point to see where the improvements need to be made in the squad. Because surely we're going to have to put out a full strength side. Otherwise, it could get embarrassing, especially if they do. Uh, but I do think it's a winnable tie because they've got a hard fixture list of it, like we have. But their top four race is a lot tighter than ours is, in my opinion. I think we're going to cruise top four. I don't think they are. So I think Ollie's going to put a lot of emphasis on winning in the league and probably see quite a bit of rotation in the Europa. Mm. Yeah, I noticed that. They, they play, I mean, I say West Ham and people will probably think, why is that a big game? But you know, West Ham are one of those teams that have found themselves challenging for the top four, and I think that's the game the between City the two good, legs. Yeah, and they City. gave City a good game. Yeah, they really uh, yes, did. I was, yes, I've been impressed by them. To be Wasn't honest, that no no as well? No, it was two, two one, one to City, City, but but West Ham equalised, and I thought they played well in the first half. Oh, um, oh West Ham. Okay, I, don't, I was West Ham United yeah. and City. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tough fixtures for them around. Uh, tough for us as well. Obviously, we've got Napoli at home. I think in between the two legs, so um, that's not easy either. But I'm just kind of they actually with... have a murderer's row. I, I know we literally just said it, but to go the Manchester derby, us West Ham, us again, and then Leicester right after. That's tough. Mm-hmm. So they they got to really weigh their options and find out. I don't think you know what fixture is the most important because that's three different comps too that's FA Cup that's Europa mm-hmm. and the league so that actually we've does got it going in our favour a little bit I'd say just from I always prefer playing the first leg away because if you can just snatch that away goal even if you lose 2-1 you know that you're going back home and just one goal could be enough to yeah. see you through and then ride out the win and with the way that it's fallen I've no disrespect to Verona because he took a point off Juventus yesterday but I'd like to think that we could put with the way that we played today, a semi-decent squad out against Verona, put a good one out against United and take something from that tie. It would be nice. And um, I understand why AJ said um, they were the team to avoid because you want to avoid drawing the, the hardest teams until the last stages of the competition. Naturally, yeah. that's your instinct as a football fan. I think it's the perfect draw for two reasons. Um even if we were to lose, I still think it's the perfect draw. I think if we were to win, you know, if we were to win the tie over two legs uh, and progress into the quarterfinals, it will prove that it will be a massive confidence boost for the start because of the opponent that we've beat in a pre-tournament favourite. It will then prove that we can go on and win the competition, which would be absolutely huge. I keep saying it, but if we're going to go for it, let's win it because this is the one that's missing from our trophy cabinet. We've mm-hmm. never won the UEFA Cup. We've not won the Europa League. So that would be nice to complete the trophy cabinet. Um, and obviously it's automatic Champions League qualification and a load of prize money that comes with it. But even if we lose... I don't think it's bad because it'll be a good yardstick, like Jan said, said, for where we are at as a squad moving into next season, which will hopefully be one which marks our return to the Champions League. And not only that, but it, it stops us wasting our time. You know, if we were always going to lose to a team of United's calibre, it stops us getting to the semis or even the final and suffering mm-hmm. the heartbreak later on and having more games under our belt. So like, if we're going to lose, let's get it out of the way now. So then we can focus on the league for the remainder of the season. Look at Inter, they got to the final and it ended up being a bit of a waste of time for them. Um, they, they did still I don't know finish if I'd the say season. that. I mean, you, you still get more prize money the further you go. 
and it's, like that's it's critical for a team compared, like that. And, uh, it's negligible sure. compared to getting back into the Champions League, which is 60, 60 million plus. I agree with that, but at the same it, time, we're we're only six points clear of not being in Champions League, so we should keep now. every route. Is it eight? I thought it was. Oh, you're right. Eight right. clear to Roman in fifth. Yeah, yeah. I I just I feel like you should keep all doors to the Champions League open, including Europa League and. I completely agree with what you're saying about getting it out of the way early, whether we could win or not. But a part of me also feels like, you know, there were teams like Molde, there were teams like Granada available that we could have drawn. You know, if we would have got one of those, it's like, okay, cool. The semis are wrapped up. We could focus on the league and feel a weaker side and get through and then, you know, worry later when we need to. But I don't know. I, I mean, I guess either way, like there's a silver lining no matter how you look at it, but regardless that I just I didn't want to face them not yet would have been a great showpiece dam- final for example it, 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 no, I think the damaging thing if we'd have got Mulder or Granada for example was we would have probably failed failed a weaker side which probably would have knocked our confidence down a bit if we didn't get the results or we weren't playing good football the critics would have been straight back out so I think it this is I think it's perfect game it's come at the perfect time and a lot, I think the lads are probably half expected a loss but a win will just do wonders for the yeah. confidence. And uh, I think that could be a massive turning point as opposed to getting knocked out by Mulder or Granada if we weren't mm-hmm. to unluckily get knocked out. I mean, that's not your confidence, doesn't it, as opposed to yeah. Another Man United. Good, good way to look at it, though, is say we do get past United. Both those teams we're talking about, Granada and Mulder, they're, they're playing each other. So one of them is going through. Mm. I mean, we get them in the, the semis sun. and it's like, all right, there's a free final. But then you look at, for example, Leicester will have been expecting to to beat Slavia Prague, especially after drawing nil nil the first game away from home. And people don't realise that what we said about Red Star being dominant domestically, you need to have a look at Slavia Prague and what they're doing in their league. Um, but they went and won two nil away at Leicester to get through, and you think all of a sudden there's none of these teams that you can't take seriously. Even like a Villarreal, you know, they've been to the final before. Um, Unai yeah. Emre is a coach, isn't he? Yeah, Villarreal. and uh, they've yeah, got Europa League it. pedigree, like Sevilla do, obviously there. Um, so yeah, I I'm happy with it. I mean, just to even from like a profile standpoint, it's nice that there's such a big tie for Milan to be involved in. It feels like it's probably going to be twice the hype from when we drew Arsenal, even though there's no fans mm. allowed and stuff. But when we drew Arsenal um, in the 2017-18 mm. season. That was very much billed as a um, clash of two fallen giants, if you know what I mean. But this feels like we're second in our league. They're sec- United are second in the Premier League. Yeah, they're not going to win the title because City are rolling, running away with it. But it feels like this is a precursor to what could be a Champions League fixture next season. And I think there'll be more eyes. eyes it's definitely that calibre of the fixture. This, mm. this is a just a, it's a classic Champions League tie. You look at some of the years, like uh, one thing that we'll have to point out is the last time that we faced Man United, Celtic, Lille, Spartan and Red well. Star. Red Star in a season. Oh, yeah, Red Star. We, went on, we went on to win the European competition, so fingers crossed. Yeah. With that. Yeah, that was 6 or 7. We actually one, kind of one scraped team. past Red, uh, Red Star to make it into the competition to yeah. begin with. So maybe that's One a... team I'm glad that we didn't draw and that I am worried about is Rangers because they are a very good side this season under Gerard, and that'd have been nah. a tough tie. They yeah. are. They haven't actually played it. I mean, they, they beat Benfica at home in the group stages. Um, they seem to be very well drilled, and they seem to have this. It doesn't matter because you know we've done everything already. Like they've got the league locked up, so that's dangerous when they're going into it with a cannot lose attitude. Um, I think who did they end up getting? They end up getting someone where I think they're going to do a job on them. Um, Slavia, they, they got Slavia. Slavia. Yeah. yeah, they yeah, got Slavia. Slavia. So it'd be funny if they did better than what Leicester did, of course. But I, I don't. I'm not worried about Rangers. I mean, yeah, like they're they're in hot, hot form right now, but their competition, in the Scottish league, it's it's not real. Let's be honest. <laughs> and the fact that they let Royal Antwerp put five past them in this over great this league, tie, was like, to be fair. Oh, it was fantastic. When's the last time you saw that many goals? You know, but at the same time, like that that tells you their defense if Antwerp could put five past them like we could put 10 we could put 15 I'm not worried. not with the finishing <laughs> be good. not with our finishing yeah, not yeah. with today's finishing <laughs> that's for sure well we could put 15 past they're just all offside that's all 
10 of them in the first 10 minutes. Um, yeah, let's move on to it then today, uh, the, the reason that we're all smiling. Um, I was fearful going into this game. I don't really know why. I think our recent, we've only won one of our last five, make that two out of our last six games, but one of our last five games at the Olympico against Roma um, doesn't feel like it's been a fixture that shined on us. And then obviously there was a thing of Roma and a kind of, even though they drew recently with Benevento, they've asserted their position in third place somewhat. Um, playing good football, um, high high scorers, you know, they, they score goals in batches. Um, players in form like Mkhitaryan, you know, he's got 17 combined goals and assists this season. Finished, um, apparently. Finished, allegedly. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I was worried about it because obviously we're being told, even though we think that it, it might just be a temporary glitch or whatever, that but we're being told that we're on a downward slide. And it just seemed like the perfect opportunity for them to put a nail, another nail in our coffin. Um, but I thought that, as a, as a general point, we'd responded superbly. We mm. came out of the gates very fast. If we were worried after that first 20 minutes at Spezia where we didn't get going at all, I think it was probably our best first 20 minutes of the season, to be honest with you. Um, we created chance after chance, two offside goals, one of which, I know this sounds weird, but the Tamari one, he wasn't stood on the pitch when, but I I don't know how yeah. the rule works for that. Yeah, so he's, off, in the he's goal offside. Now. He's still yeah. offside because of it, that. Yeah. yeah. I actually think he was behind the he'd... keeper, I think. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Because it came off there. Defenders came are actually there. looking at it, yeah. thinking. If he was on the pitch, I think it, I think he'd have been onside if he was mm. on the Yeah, I think pitch. it's just because he was in the net and came back in, mm. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it, I think so. It was confusing. I thought it was good at first. I was like, okay, Tomori scored. We're great. Mm. But then they, they called it off. I don't know. It was strange. But if there ever was a chance for a team to catch a slipping and to capitalize on it, it, it was this game. I, and I think I predicted maybe a loss last time. I don't, I don't remember what I predicted, but. This morning I woke up and I was feeling it and I, I said we were going to win. We did, not nearly as comfortably as I thought, but uh, we got the job done. But I don't know. You, just, you look at Roma's history this season, I think they've got the least amount of points against top six sides this season out of like it's all now the three, big teams. It's, it's now three out of 24 points against yeah. the top six teams. I think they have a loss against every single one of them so far, right? A loss or a draw? Uh, they've drawn twice against somebody and I can't remember who it is. They drew against oh, they've us. Played, and... They've played somebody twice. Uh, either way, it's really bad. You know, it's yeah, typical it's... Roma. Like they, yep. they, they're flat track bullies. They just batter everyone below them. But when it comes to to games against teams around them, they tend to really struggle. Yeah, I think as much as it was a good performance, and we should have wrapped it up in the first five minutes. Um, we do have to count ourselves a bit lucky that they had a few players missing. I think, I think some of the at chances the they created at the back end. Even Jekko could have finished a couple of their chances off that were easily missed. So I think, in a way, we were kind of lucky, but we deserved to win anyway, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, we were lucky that's that the perfect way to look at it. But I think there were some great performances from some players, in like Tamari, for example. I was going to... I was going to say, um, AJ said about waking up this morning feeling optimistic. I did as well, more so than when we recorded the, the preview podcast. Um, and it was because of that. I, th- I feel like that had a massive morale booster for the entire fan base who were all of a sudden like, finally, Pioli has decided to make a proactive change that in theory makes a lot of sense on paper. And it did because yeah. upon finding out that Jekyll was out, I think it removed the temptation or the need to play Romagnoli and Kier because then you've got um, Boy and Mayoral. He was always going to play like a false nine. He was never going to be the same centre forward. So we needed Tamori to to follow him, you know, to make sure that he didn't um, didn't get any space to turn and operate. And uh, it ended up working pretty well. It ended up working. I think a well. big side yeah. effect of doing it is the message you're sending to the rest of the players that. Nobody is safe. You need to earn your spot. We're dropping the mm-hmm. captain of the team right now because he's been bad. That's mm-hmm. going to give everyone that kick in the ass they need to, you know, give that extra 10%, whatever it is. And and it showed, you know, we saw every time Leal had the ball, he tried something fancy and say nine out of 10 tries, it, it worked. You know, he looked really good. Uh, Kessier was fantastic. Tonali was good. I mean, he had that diving save where he had his foot crazy up there and saved it. Donnarumma blocked the shot with his face. I mean, like, yeah, this team, funny. with as unlucky as we got, also pulled out all the stuff. I mean, it for every it was a battle. It was a real we battle. had some weird 
things happen, but we, we got through it. And that's mm-hmm. the resilience that a team like this needs, especially to bounce back. I mean, we had three, three substitutions due to injury. Mm-hmm. That, that's weird, you know? Yeah, it is. It is. I think Paoli's coming to some really unfair criticism lately. I mean, I go back to the intergame. I wouldn't say we were atrocious. I think hand on I mentioned it last week, Handanovic had a couple of miraculous saves and that changed the whole fight. And it proved in this game how our finishing could potentially cost us because he missed three chances in the opening five minutes, like clear cut chances. I'm not talking oh well on another day, like clear cut chances, it should have gone in. And then everyone were criticizing saying he doesn't have the balls to drop Romagnoli to make a big decision like that. And he goes out and does it in a must win game. But now he's got an even harder decision to make because you can't drop Tamari after that performance or Kier. But you can't leave your captain sitting on the bench for too long. So mm. this is where he's got a tough decision coming now. I, don't I do envy have him. I have mixed emotions on Pioli today. I mean, he like you said, he had the balls to drop Romagnoli. That was the right decision. And I think his substitutions were right but also wrong. You know, I, I can't blame him for any of the, the injury subs. Those That is what it is. But I do think when you're you have eight minutes left in a game to defend a one point lead and things have gone the way that this game did, bringing on Mete and bringing on Castillejo is a big risk, you know, especially when things are going well. Just leave it as it is, you know. I would argue no subs is the better sub in that situation. Granted, it paid off, it worked, and Mete didn't look that bad, but I don't know, it was a little risky. I was confused on the substitutions, like when Krunich came on, for example. Why not bring on Jens Better, okay. someone who yeah we excluded from Europa so that he could play in the league. Why not give him minutes? You know, I, I don't know. There were some weird moves, but ultimately it worked out. So eight out of I 10. just, I, will, I think with the substitutions, I know what you're saying. Like the, they were going to make absolutely no real impact on the game whatsoever. I think um, part of it's time. Uh, it eats away a bit at the clock. Like there's sure. no point having unused subs when you've got a one goal lead. You might as well eat away at the time as much as you can. Secondly, it's just fresh legs, isn't it? Like if we were going to get the ball and lump it long. Yeah, but I, I, I disagree almost. I, you know, I get fresh legs. That's a big boost. But that's a boost when there's 20 minutes left of the game. When there's eight minutes left, the mm. pace is set. You know, how long is it going to take those fresh legs to get acclimated to where the game's at now? You know, you're, you're risking also, easy mistakes. Yeah, and also when you're defending well as a unit, it's a risk to change your defensive midfielder mm-hmm. because you never know yeah, it, what, what when he's having he have. a game like he's having, like he was helping making us tick. Like you spoke yeah, about exactly. how there was real no Kessie reason was, to bring him off. No, definitely not. Like we talked, you spoke about how Kessie did everything on Thursday, but that's because of the partner that he had next to him, and then with a competent partner like Tenali next to him. They both brought the best out of each other. And I think Ben Anser, he's got a job getting back into the squad now. I, because... Well, I think he, he's going to be definitely um, drip-fed back into the team because we cannot risk another aggravation. By the sounds of it, Ben Anser is going to be fit for Wednesday night. Uh, Tonali is undroppable for me at the moment. Um, you, you don't drop Tonali for Ben Anser, certainly not on Wednesday night because it'd be a daft risk. Um, but you probably get Ben Anser 20, 30 minutes if you if you can find a way to do that. And then you we'll see. The like bomb they... on me. I didn't know we played Wednesday night, but apparently we do. <laughs> yeah, it's the San Remo break, isn't it, for Ibra? Um, so that should be fun. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the it's, it's, it's the good game. to have him and Mandzukic back, hopefully. Well, they're, they're out both. again. They're both injured again. They, they play 40 minutes to get injured every time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. A miraculous injury for Ibrahimovic to the... Yeah. Wait, just before he flies to, well, whatever. To well, Pioli doesn't sound too worried after the game. He says that he thought it was more just fatigue than a natural muscle problem. So that's good news. Um, that implies that it, yeah. it won't be a lengthy absence. Such well, words. nothing helps fatigue like going to a music festival and partying. So that was sarcasm, <laughs> by the way. Are we worried about Ibra at the minute, like confidence-wise? Because he's having shock. No, it, but I, I think he's ability, having shock yeah. in front of goal. Exactly. Is it his age? Maybe like, it's I think he's actually like, yeah, creeping He's still up getting in like, the position. I think he's snapping he's getting in chances. the positions. Yeah. I think he's desperate to score. I think once he does score, mm. the light can flood him. But there was no excuse for it. today. He he um he should have scored on the one where Tamari ended up scoring the follow up. And also he, he has stuck as a 39-year-old. 
who knows the game and has scored so many goals, you have to hold your run. Um, That's the thing, too. If Ebers is supposed to be the slowest person in the league, how is he ahead of Rebic on that run? You know, like, Mm. come on. I mean, I know it was close. I know it was half a yard, a yard. But um, you've got to know that if you're going to be there for the square option, make sure you're an actual option and don't distract Rebic from shooting. Right. Uh, and then he because would have... the, the the finish that Rebic supplied in the second half suggests that if Rebic would have shot, we'd have been one nil up there. Well, I wonder it, how much that is would... is like Ibra every single time they play, no matter what, he's saying, "Give me the fucking ball all game long." I wonder if he's just like Ibra's there. I better give him the ball. You know, like mm-hmm. I would wonder if if Ibra stayed on, would Rebic have even taken that shot that he did score? Maybe. If... Yeah, maybe. On the other chance that he had, he worked so hard to close down uh, yeah. the goalkeeper. Pound and he did, pass, every, yeah. he did all the hard bits. And then come to the finish, I don't know why he's back healed it, but he could have also just played it back to Hakan, who had an easy finish. Like, yeah. He Two did options, all the hard yeah. bits right. And then for someone of it, I'd expect that from some, someone like Leal, like Balotelli when he did it for Man City, young, naive. But not from a 39 year old striker that scored 500 plus goals. In well, Bob Telly also did it in a preseason game, you know, a game that didn't yeah, exactly. Got, yeah. and got <laughs> subbed off. a battle for the Scudetto. It's like, come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. He got subbed off as well for that, which was quite funny. I think that was Mancini, wasn't it? His head coach. Yeah. Uh, but he had two options. Yeah. He could have laid it back to Hakan, as you say. And Hakan could have really used a goal for his confidence because just to briefly touch on him. Um, another kind of anonymous performance for the first 45 minutes and then he gets taken off with what we're told is a muscle discomfort um, so that's obviously a little bit of a worry but it makes me wonder obviously he's taken off at half time which makes me think that it wasn't like one incident like 35 minutes where he pulls up and he requests to be changed it makes me wonder if he's been playing with a little bit of a a tweak this entire time and he just I think can't he has. through it. Yeah. Yeah, because he came back and didn't look good and really hasn't mm-hmm. looked great since his return from injury. So and now he's coming off again. I think that's kind of been a trend. You know, everyone's been hurt, then they come back and it's almost like we're rushing them back, even though the subs are are playing their role. You know, we're we're getting good results. Why are we rushing players back, obviously? Because that's what's mm-hmm. happening. They're coming back and getting hurt again and then they're out longer. We've seen it with Slatan. I'm going to be there. Hakan, Rebic, everyone. With Hakan, I think I'm not going to lie. I think his head's elsewhere, or it's beginning to look elsewhere now. I think the contract situation. I think that's Maldini's failure. He should have got it sorted in the winter market, and now it's eating up. It's becoming like talking the news. It does have an effect on the players if they don't know where the future lies in three months' time. Like, how can you expect the player to give the? Uh, I know the professionals, but how can you expect someone to give the role? It's like if us guys were told that our contract in our jobs up in three months' time, and you don't know if we're going to keep you or not, your performance dips. And I think that is something that it needs nipping in the bud and pretty quickly. But, I think yeah, there's like, also the the mental aspect of, um, and I believe the reports that suggest that Hakan wants to stay because otherwise he would have been free to sign a pre-contract elsewhere by now. But if that's his stance as a player, he wants to stay at the club. And he's just saying, I want a bit of a pay rise in order to do so, to, in line of how important I've been as a player for you over the last 12 months. And it feels like the club aren't willing to meet that. The club are saying, no, this is what we think you're worth, and it's less than what you think you're worth. Um, it, it's kind of a difficult one, isn't it? Because it's it's a game of chicken and it's like who backs down first. And obviously every player has their own agent that's a bastard to deal with. Obviously, Mina Raiola for, for Gigio. And Gordon Stipic is, is a tough negotiator too and he's trying to get every every penny. I, I think he really, like, there's no reason to doubt the, the optimism that comes from the club, both in comments and from what you hear from reliable sources, I think both of them renew, but I think now it's become a duty to get both Donnarumma and Chalanoglu to renew, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Otherwise, it's going to keep dominating the media. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that, with... but... Uh, go ahead. No, go. I was just going to say, I think a big issue with, with that situation is, yeah, we're saying we think you're worth less than what you think you're worth, but you as the player can prove your worth every single week. Mm. You have an obligation to yourself and your team to go out there and show why you think you're worth the money you're demanding. And when you're performing the way he is, you're telling the club that they're right and you're wrong. 
So that's going to hurt your mental a little bit more. Yeah. But it's either you suck it up and, and go with what they're offering you based off your performances or you kick yourself in the next gear and, and do something about it. But I don't know. I don't see exactly. It. I agree. I think the future is really in his hands. Like, look, we can't expect two goals to assist every game from him. That's just, it's not normal, but just to create the chances, just to put a shift in like we've seen him do. And he just doesn't look interested. And, Part of it may be because, look, he might be carrying a niggle and he has come back from COVID, so cut him a bit of slack there. But he does need to up his form. He's it, got 17 goals and assists in all competitions this season, which is a lot, in fairness. Mm. But some of them have come in, you know, the Europa League qualifying stages against like Bodo and Rio Ave and stuff like that. So, I don't know. I think he, he needs to up his performances, but I think Maldini needs to pull his finger out and be like, look, this is the final offer. If you don't like it, sign your contract elsewhere mm-hmm. or let's sit down and just sign the contract. Same with Gigi. I think it's getting to that situation now where we're coming to a crucial part of the season and how can you expect half of your team to be on board with a project and give the role if you see two, maybe three key players if you include Ibra? Not knowing where the future lies, Ibra's going to this festival, Hack and Gigi, you don't know if they're going to be here in three months. How can you trust a project if your key players not necessarily a part of it. Mm-hmm. Especially with no. Gigio, you know, you just benched your captain and made him captain. Like, what does that say that your new your new captain doesn't even know if he's going to be on the squad in, in four months? Like, exactly. You, we, we got to put a captain on the bench and your vice captain is currently three months away from leaving. Like, it's just bonkers. And yeah. I think that's his biggest failure. And that's why I gave the market rate in a six out of ten because – he didn't bring in a right winger, which we needed. And I said the contributions are more important than signings because that would show that the project is real and yeah. it'd be a big boost for the younger players. The renewals would have been like, I hate saying like two new signings, but like it's two big signings in the pen to mm-hmm. paper and resolving the future of two key players. I think uh, I, I think the Chalonoglu renewal is closer purely because the amounts that we're talking about are less. It's not a ten, potential £10 million a year deal or whatever. Um, and I think the Chalonoglu deal gets signed somewhere around £4 million plus bonuses, which is a pay rise that I would say that he's earned based on his performance over the tw- last 12 months. But then it's up to him to prove that he's worth that you know, for the long run. Um, the Donnarumma thing I, I also think gets done, to be honest, but I can understand why this one's dragging out. Um, I've said it many a time before. Um, I think Raiola, the psychology of it, he loves to be in control as an agent. And um, Gigio, who's one of his most valuable clients in terms of market value, in terms of age potential and everything, has probably told him, I don't want to move in my career. You know, I'm happy to stay at Milan for life. And Gigio th- uh, and Raiola's thinking, well, shit, how am I going to get my commission off this guy? So... He then tries to, to shift the balance again uh, and take control of the situation by um, making renewal talks as difficult as possible, trying to get high salary, a short-term contract so it can be revisited in a couple of years, release clause even, so he can dangle that over the club's head. I understand why there's more politics at play with that renewal. Um, I honestly still think they both get done and, you know, happy to be... No, I'd be unhappy to be proven wrong on that, but... Um, I feel less gutted to lose Chalanoglu, to be honest, especially the way that he's playing at the moment. But Hakan's yeah, replaceable. Gijo's not at the end of yeah, the day. Yeah. Like I think Gijo where... is generational. Hakan, yeah. you can replace. Yeah, yeah. So we've got two games to preview before we record next time. Um, midweek game against Udinese at San Siro, which, of course, Zlatan... For those who don't know, basically, uh, Zlatan's apparently going to do the the warm down session at Milanello tomorrow, and then he's going to leave for, for San Remo. He's going to stay in Liguria and uh, he's going to have his own personal trainer there. Uh, he's going to be there Tuesday uh, night and then come back Wednesday for the game, back there on Thursday and stay through until Saturday night, which is the last uh, night of the festival, and then um, travel to Verona to meet up with the team there. Um, we've spoken, I suppose, at length already about how we feel about the whole San Remo appearance and stuff. Um, but yeah, used in Eze on, on Wednesday night at San Siro, it's a tough one, really, because it doesn't feel like we've ever really easily beaten Udinese ever. I can't remember us giving him a spanking for a long time. Um, and I don't know how I feel about this one. I think 
there's half a chance that we're, we're going to rotate in this game because we may have three potential muscle problems to deal with there. Um, ben Asair and Mandzukic are probably not going to be risked from the start. Uh, so we might have to field some kind of patchwork 11 in that game, aside from the defence, which is going to remain the same. So I think this is going to be a difficult one. Just looking at uh, Udinese, they have um, at the moment, looking at the wrong table, um, should, should probably know more about them, to be totally honest with you. Uh, but they're currently in 12th. Seven wins, seven draws, 10 defeats. Uh, they've got a minus seven goal difference, uh, but they've won three of their last five games and only lost once. Um, I think they're, you know, they're what they always are, which is a, a lower mid-table team. But it could be a difficult one. I'm not going to say my prediction just yet. I don't think it's going to be that tough, to be honest. Um, I think this win that we got today against Roma is kind of reorganize us, put us right back on course. And I think we're going to build on that again. And, you know, probably not go the 18 games unbeaten or whatever the, the run was at the beginning of the year. But I think it's it's going to help us spur forward again. And we're going to really push to get back those points we've lost to enter. And um, I, I don't think it's going to be a difficult game. I mean, like you said, they're, they're a bottom mid-table team. The only thing special about them is DePaul. Um, I, I don't know what his status is for this game, but – I know he scored a penalty against us in the return leg, but we also won that 2-1. Uh, I think we won our last two games against them, scoring five in those two. So I'm not too worried. I think, uh, we'll, I think we'll do a job. And if Tamori starts again, then, you know, we might see even better defense this time. Yeah, I'm not worried about it either, really. Like, DePaul, he's always a threat, but when he's got no one, you know, to play the ball through to, I mean, there's nothing much that he can do. Um, the bit that I suppose I'm a little bit worried about is Musa, the goalkeeper, because he is a fantastic goalkeeper. I think he deserves better than Udinese. And if our finishing is anything like it was uh, tonight, or it has been recently, I don't think we're going to get past him. That being said, I hope it is a lot better our finishing. It has to be done. It. I mean, I, I said in a tweet, I'm not one of these who puts an awful lot of weight or emphasis on XG, expected goals, apart from when it shows like um, one extreme or the other. So if we've got a 0.1 XG, I'd be looking at that thinking, hmm, that suggests that we created absolutely nothing. Or if like we had at half time, we had a 2.66 XG and we'd only scored once. Um, that suggests we're creating quality chances and not sticking them away. Um, and as you say, I just feel like a lot of averages were going to start, if we were perhaps more clinical in the first half of the season, and so far in 2021 or the second half of the season, we've been creating chances, but we've been a lot more wasteful. Everything suggests we're going to find the equilibrium at some point, um, and, and hopefully that means that we're getting back to those two goals a game, as we did. We went on that massive run, obviously, scoring twice in every game virtually. That would be nice, um, definitely. Musa, as you say, fantastic. If for whatever reason the Donnarumma uh, talks were to completely break down, got to be having a look at someone like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, prediction then, I guess. Uh, I'll go 2-1. I, I, just, I, I'd love to see us keep a clean sheet. It feels like it's been a while since we had one. Um, but I, yeah, Rodrigo de Powell's going to score, obviously. Um, interesting though, you know, how do you think... Oh, Dale, for you. Oh, yeah, of course, he plays there as well. Or um, Kevin Lasagna. Great, man. Uh, yeah, I've got two. Uh, Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Penny Arcade. Uh, right, yeah. I'm going to go... I'm going to go 3 nil. Contradict nice. everything that I've just said, but yeah, 3 nil. I was going to say 2 nil. Hmm. Somewhere in between us, but um, and then we've got Hellas Verona on Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, I think it is. So that's nicer time for recording next week. Um, Verona started the season well, they obviously had a good season last season and started the season well, they carried on that momentum. Um, but they're faltering a little bit, they're struggling to win games. They've won one out of their last five, it may even extend beyond that. I can only see recent form. Uh, one nine, drawn eight, lost seven. Positive goal difference though. 
Uh, their defence definitely seems to be their strong point because they've conceded the least goals outside of the top five, top six, sorry. Um, but they, they struggle to score. They've only scored 31 times in 24 games. Uh, just a few random stats, really. Um, players to keep an eye on, though, definitely. Matteo Lovato, we've talked about him a few times on this podcast. Did a report earlier today saying that we're still keeping an eye on him. Um I still wouldn't be surprised, you know, if we tried to bring in another centre-back as well as redeeming Tamori. Because obviously Duarte and Masaccio are gone now. Um, and then it depends what we see Kalulu as. Um, if we see him as a genuine fifth-choice centre-back, which seems quite low down for him. Uh, or if we're going to convert him to right-back full-time, then there might be a spot for a young centre-back to grow. Uh, we shall see. But um, then there's also Matteo Zaccagni, who we keep being linked with, who I think would be a really good sort of backup number 10 for us. Um, again, providing that Chelanoglu stays, works incredibly hard, creative, can play on the wing, um, presses like mad. He, he, I, I like him. I think he's a very good player. And I think there's no surprise that apparently Inter and Napoli are also taking a look at him. So those two are worth keeping an eye on, in my opinion. And DeMarco plays there as well, doesn't he? Um, good, I really like DeMarco. Back. Yeah, I, I like him as back. well. I like him. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's plays to keep an eye on there. And uh, that all that being said as well, I think, again, Verona has been a real mixed hunting ground for us. It doesn't feel like we've ever won comfortably there, um, apart from against Kievo, and obviously they're not in the division anymore. Um, I mean, historically, if we have bad results against them, don't we, when we lost like, the league title yeah. 10 years back and stuff like that. Yeah, not in, not in recent history, though. I mean, just going back in time right now, our last three fixtures against them, 1-1 one, one draw, one win, one zero win for us, and then four one win for us as well. So I mean, recently we've been able to get the results, um, but that doesn't make them an easy team because their last three games against Juventus, you know, they've they've gotten two points against them this season. Last I was year really impressed as well. with them. Yeah, I, 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 was mean, really I, I think they're a much better Juve. team than Udinese. Um, I, I think mm. this one's going to be harder. We'll see what happens. I think I can't remember the the first game of the season this year against them for us. Obviously, it was one one draw. I know that, but. Was that a game that we were unlucky to draw or were we lucky yeah, to we pull had that like off? I can't remember. 172 shots at goal and 171 yeah, of right. them were on target. So, yeah, okay. it was one of them games. That was one of the annoying yeah, mm-hmm. games where we dropped points. Yeah, I, I think that's a game we hit back draws that were really frustrating. And I think mm-hmm. this was that's one a of them. Game we hit the woodwork like four or five times in the yeah. match. Yeah, wow. we we went two was- nil down in. Uh, we we started well, but then ended up two nil down inside twenty minutes, and mm. then um, that was the one where Ibra had the disallowed goal. That wasn't yeah. against Hellas, was it? No. Are you no. on about the um, game earlier this season at San Siro? That wasn't against Hellas, though. We finished early this season one one. No, it was two all. Yeah, it got was. it up now. Because uh, when Ibra scored in the last minute. Yeah, it's got 91st minute. The, the header. Like after having just had oh, a goal Jesus this Christ, I have it up too. It. I'm so stupid. Yeah. I was looking at... <laughs> well, we drew one all with him last season. So that that's what I was, that yeah, so I was looking at. That's what I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. But no, that was a good game. And and I think um, probably uh, Hellas showed literally everything that they can do in that game. They put us under difficulty early on, and we were lucky to kind of come away with even a point from that. Um, but yeah, I've just looked at him. They've got Nikola Kalinic. Fucking hell. That means nothing. I, th- I think this, these next two games, Udinese and Hellas, I think it's a big moment for Leal. We've all been like, oh, he should be starting at left wing, blah, blah, blah. But he's looked all right, but he's end, like, it's all right dribbling past three or four players, but he's end product. He does need to work on a bit. And I think with either have been at San Remo and potentially being out injured, Rebic being out injured, he and, and Hakan potentially being out injured, he's going to have to lead the line and he's going to have to put a lot of work in. And this is really a very good chance for him to prove maybe some doubt is wrong and then prove the people that have been backing him correct. It's a massive game for him. Yeah, I think he'll do better finishing-wise if he's he's playing down the middle. Like, he will probably against Ellis if Zlatan's still hurt. But today he didn't have anyone that he could pass it on to you know and he had to come from the left so I think that kind of limits him a little bit but other than that I'd agree with you If Mandzukic is fit do you think he should start at centre forward over Leal? No. In any given game? No. No? 
I'd do. Yeah, I, I would start him. I, personally. Too. I'd have Leal play left wing, but I'd ask him to play closer, you know, like Rebic does, and, and get into dangerous areas. My thinking is, Leal scored six goals this season, and all of them have been as a centre-forward. And uh, his last one was Torino, the 2-0 league win, um, the one where Brahim Diaz slipped it through to him to make it 1-0. Um, it feels like a while since we've seen that. Well, he came off the bench tonight, for example, and did that nice little sidestep. But then the end product wasn't there. And that's like the theme of the last few weeks, really, for him. Um, mm. But Jan's right. This is his moment. Like, he needs to seize it. He needs to grab it by the scruff of the neck because otherwise those doubts start to creep in again. Like, if someone makes an offer in the summer, you know... I think you, if, if Mandzukic is going to start at centre forward, we have to be in a different formation. It, it's got to be a 3-5-2 or something with the two strikers up top. And that's where Leal will shine as a second striker. I mean, that's what he, he was supposed to do when we originally brought in Eber was Leal's second striker. And it worked. You know, we saw their chemistry early on. I, I don't know why we ever moved away from that. Obviously, we had success. So it's like, why, why change it? But I don't know. I, I think, I think that... if we're going to have Mandzukic up top, he's not enough on his own to be that dynamic player. He's got to have a second striker. A winger won't cut it. Well, he's not fit enough, I don't think. With... Leal, he plays a lot better with Ibra and it builds up his confidence more because Ibra kind of, as much as Ibra's harsh on everyone, Ibra brings the best out of him, he lets him like kind of flow with the ball and do what he wants to do, whereas Rebic, Rebic seems almost scared of Ibra like tonight when he passed the ball instead of shooting like everyone thinks that they've got to pass the ball to Ibra, whereas with Leal he'll just, he kind of does what he wants and he's not afraid mm-hmm. of Zlatan, but it brings the best out of him and, Zlatan encourages him quite a bit, so I do prefer them two playing together. Yeah, well, having Zlatan on the field means two defenders are going to be on him at all times. So that mm-hmm. means Leone has one person he has to step over, whereas Rebic will try the same thing, but he's not as good with his feet, so he'll run into the defender and lose the ball. But Leal can actually get around him, and then Zlatan can head it in or whatever he has to do. Um, I just think that's the ideal partnership. We should be starting Leal, even though Rebic obviously scored and had a decent game today, I think Leal should be starting over him. I do think we inherently play better football with a more mobile centre forward as well. It encourages us to move the ball a lot quicker and we're not looking always for that hold-up player. Um, but then at the same time, um, when Leal goes missing, he really goes missing. But when Ibra's having a bad game, he's still always there to cling on to for, you know, flinging crosses to the back post or whatever it might be that we do in desperation. Um, but yeah, you need something from your number nine at all times. And that's my worry about when we're looking for Ibra's successor, and that's for a whole other video. But um, we need to be very careful about the kind of profile that we go after. Because if we just go for somebody who's an instinct finisher, I think we're going to find it a more difficult transition. They need to almost be able to do everything. Um, otherwise, we ain't going to get close to what we have in a one-striker system at the moment. Um, did we do have us for on predictions? No, we didn't. Uh, so, based on what I saw from last night, I think we're also going to draw 1-1. I think there's still a bit of fatigue in this squad. Um, and... I think Hellas Verona are a well-drilled team and Juric likes taking points off big teams. So I'll be the cautious one and say a 1-1 draw. And I don't think it would be an awful result. I really don't. You know, yes, it's dropped points and if we are Scudetto serious, whatever, um, but but better teams will, will drop points to worse teams. I think we're going to win 2-1 and I think it's going to be two points gained when you consider the 1-1 draw, the 2-2 draw at the start of the season. But I think it's going to be a hard game from the point of we've got United on the Thursday. And like I said earlier, I think we're going to put out a semi-rotated squad in the part of go to United and bring home a goal, at least. Yeah, I think the lineup's going to be unique, to say the least. Um, and a lot of it depends on how we do against Udinese. I'm, I'm pretty confident, so is John, but it's still a tough game, but it's going to be a good barometer of where we're at as far as going forward, you know, with riding our momentum after the Roma win. So I'm a little nervous. Um, I, I do think the safe answer is a one, one. Yeah. I hope, I hope we're both wrong on that. Um, yeah, me too. In the right way and, and that we lose and that the team prove us wrong again. I do think that, um, and it may sound daft because we've had Inter and Roma and this is, only Udinese and Hayes Verona, but if we were to come out of these next two games with six points, it would actually be a pretty big message that we aren't done yet. 
you know, we, we, we still, we're still going to put the pressure on into just like they put the pressure on us and waited until we eventually slip up. Um, you can't rule out the, the top two positions changing a little bit more between now and the end of the season. Yeah, I said it in the group chat that I genuinely believe we will be back at the top of the table before the season ends. And let's just say, inter literally, they're an injury away from the season. And we know downhill. it's to uh, as well. so, Yeah, as soon as Lukaku gets an injury, or if he gets COVID, I, I don't wish it on anyone, but if that was to happen to him, I think in her then becoming real troubles, I think. And I don't I don't see him winning every game from now till the end of the season, neither. Mm-hmm. They've got well, some and they didn't in the, they didn't win every game in the first half of the season either, you know. I mean yeah, exactly. the only reason they were as close to us as they were is because of the silly points that we dropped, like against Hellas Verona. So if we can turn those like and today against Roma, you know, that was a draw in the reverse. So we turn that around. There's our two points gained. So Minus a three, I don't know. I mean, it's almost leveling itself out. It's, it just depends. You know, we, we just got to keep turning around those fixtures that we screwed up on in the first half and hope that Inter continue to screw up theirs. Would be nice. Does, did, did an article earlier today basically say now um, how ridiculous it's going to be towards those last five, six rounds of the season because that's when the everyone starts playing each other. You know, we've got Juve and you, Lazio, Juve and Atalanta, I think we've in, yeah, yeah. In, it's who's going to mess up the Roma. most on the small teams. Yeah, um, so that'll be interesting. Um, right, I'm eager to move on to questions here. Uh, Mitch Silkowski and Hamko ask a similar kind of thing. Um, would we have got today's win against Roma with Romagnoli starting? Uh, and thoughts on the Tamori Alessio comparisons? I, think I don't think there's really any comparison. I think they're two entirely different defenders. They one plays zonal, one plays man marking, one's fast, one's slow, one has confidence, one doesn't. I mean, they're they're almost perfect foils for each other. So comparisons are silly. But as far as would we have won with Romagnoli in today, um, I'm going to say no. There was multiple occasions where Tamori was able to sprint back, catch the runner, and then slide in and steal that ball. Whereas Romagnoli is not fast enough to do that. He, he would have been in a zonal position anyway, so he wouldn't have had to track back. But we saw how he was against Lukaku. We saw how he was against other defenders. He doesn't. Um, he, he's not committing to a challenge anymore. It it's, might be confidence, it might be skill, I don't know, but he's not committing. And all Roma would have to have done at that point would, you know, sidestep one way, trick shot, fake, and then it, it's in. There was multiple chances where I think Roma would have scored if it was Romagnoli in play. I think it's a tough question, because like you said, the two totally different players. Tamari's riding a load of confidence at the minute, and Romagnoli's a total opposite. But Gijo did make a couple of good saves. I was saying to AJ before we started, I think as good as tomorrow's performance was, not taking anything away from it, I think we are overhyping it slightly in the fact that he was caught out of position quite, let's say, two or three times, and it was his speed that made up for it. So obviously it looks good when he's making these last ditch tackles and stuff, but it's not something he should be putting himself in the position to do, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that we'd have lost it without him, and I'm not going to say that we'd have won it with Romagnoli. It's, we won, and that's all that matters. And whether it, it doesn't matter who's playing as long as we win. Mm, I can't. Yeah. It's, 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 hard to, it's hard to say that because Romagnoli might have not been offside when tomorrow he won, he might have netted it, and we might. It's just one of them. Mm-hmm. It is just one of them things. You just it's like nitpicking at things. Right, and, and I'm not saying Tamori had a you know a 10 out of 10 performance. You could go back in the, in the 13th minute, Tamori had the ball, he tried to pass it to Kier, and it was a little baby pass straight to whomever the Roma player was that created a counter, but luckily yeah. we blocked it so that gets forgotten, you know, but he definitely made yeah. mistakes as well. I don't, I don't really get this whole player battles thing at the moment. Like, fair enough if you're here to argue um, about, um, I don't know, like... Tamori against um, a player from another team. But I don't get this idea that if a player on your team had been playing instead, we would have lost that game. It's like I've seen so many daft tweets slagging off Simon Kier, um, weirdly for, for the fact that he hasn't won a trophy. And I'm just thinking, this guy's one of our own players. He came in for three and a half million euros. Um, he's surpassed all expectations you know, realistically, because he wasn't even starting for Atalanta and he rocked up and he, he breathed new life into that defence and we became incredibly solid and he couldn't put a foot wrong. 
And now all of a sudden it's like infighting and it doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good. We, we don't stand to gain anything from it. Um, the trophy and, argument's and really weird too stops. because our club has only won one, you know, in the past eight years. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's just yeah. it's coming from the same strange people, like the ones that will bash Calabria, the big up other players, like bashing Mate at the minute. Like, yeah, he's not been great, but he's been brought in as a fourth choice centre back that's been thrown into a starting eleven when he hadn't played for a couple of weeks before. He's in a whole new team, whole new tactics. He's not no longer mid table fighting relegation. He's fighting for the top four, and it just winds me up. Like, just be happy for the players, be glad for what we've got, and stop. Yeah, just stop bashing them. Really, like you can be critical of Robin Yoli, but it doesn't mean we want him to fail. It's just no. analyzing no. poor performances from him. Just be, just, just be objective. Just like have a bit of nuance in every single way. Robin Yoli's you... only one. The Supercoppa Italiana with us, like, what does that mean? Does that mean he's not? I, I, we tweeted something like, on just... AC Milan data earlier today, and it was literally Romagnoli's winning penalty because it was on this day that he scored that penalty <laughs> to send us to the cup final. And someone said, Don't tweet stuff like this to pull the wool over people's eyes with his recent performances. And like, I, I, I had to reply and say, We can't help who scored the winning penalty to send us to a cup final. Just right. because he's had bad recent performances doesn't erase the fact that that happened. Um, I and I think it's just a perfect example of the reactionary nature of this fan base. I'd want nothing more than Romagnoli to be dropping 10 out of 10 performances every week. And so I want him to prove us wrong. I want I, I every really player mean. to... And it, it's no good having an agenda about stuff like... No. If a player's playing bad, that means the squad's playing bad and it's not good. So why like, be yeah, happy people, about it? People who've got this, um, there, there might have been people who came into the season saying, okay, Calabria's going to have a dip in form, Dalot's going to nail that right back spot moving forward. Might not have been too controversial an opinion at the start of the season, but um, things change, circumstances change. Midfield department, for example, you might have said Ben Asser will be on lockdown for most of the season. He's going to start over Tenali. Tenali's going to be eased in, blah, blah, blah. Injuries and stuff, circumstances change, and we are where we are with it. Um, so yeah, just keep your opinions in a separate box and change them out for better opinions when they arrive. That would be my <laughs> advice. Um, moving on, Ludwig asks if we make top four this season, which players in the squad would you let go of? So I assume he means ones that aren't quite good enough. Um, um we've got to find a way with he, Oh, yeah, let's start with the loans then. I, I'm saying Mete is not hanging around. Mete, I, don't, Mete, I don't think Brahim will. I think uh, I'm, I'm still torn on Brahim. Like, I really am. I think he's just getting nailed in Serie A, isn't he? Like, when he comes on, they're just knocking mm-hmm. 10 bells out of him. Like, he's not even getting a chance to prove himself. But he knew that he, he did I just look don't a think bit he's better. Bigger, just, stronger. It's a different. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. Is, I'm just, it's one of them with thinking thinking bit the lot. I don't want to see him here. No. Mate, I don't. Brahim's 50 50 for me. If he stays for the right price, brilliant. If he goes, eh, whatever. If his dollar is half of what it is, I'd be okay with it because I think mm. he's performed yeah. like a 15 million euro player, not, not 30. I think it's too much right now. I think there's still time as well with Brahim. We don't really need to make a judgment call on him immediately. I mean, all the rumours at the moment suggest that the option is there to potentially extend his loan for another year. Would, if if that was the thing, I then okay I think that's that. a sensible solution. Yeah. 100%. But then at and the same time, he might time, get more game time Ira, if, if Hakan's injury is more serious than we think. Like He might get game time right now. Oh, and we, granted, oh, he then, didn't get oh, in the way of Teo, Teo's run today. That, that frustrated me. Yeah, Teo had a yeah, shot. He did, actually. Granted, yeah. Teo probably should have passed it, but at the same time... He should. Brahim yeah. shouldn't have been tracking the exact same spot, you know. Mm. So it, yeah, and that just big indicator will, will be if Chalanoglu is injured and he chooses to play Liao as a ten. I don't think it'll happen, but let's say he did that, then we'd be like, yeah, Brahim doesn't have a future here, to be honest. Yeah, but also it depends if if we've already got a replacement in mind. You know, we're not willing to hang around and see if Brahim's going to be a possibility. Well, we kind of see Krunic play as a ten a lot lately. Yeah, I don't think that's a long-term solution, but it certainly hasn't looked terrible, albeit against Red Star. Um, but the the Otavio thing's an interesting one. Like, you know, he, he starts every game at number ten for Porter, and that's nothing to you know 
instantly write him off for. Uh, I think he's amazing in terms of the stats that he puts up or anything like that. I've only watched him on a couple of occasions in the Champions League and thought he looks okay, really. But then you think, well, if he's going to be that kind of player that we can put in in rotation situations, he'll look better with better teammates mm-hmm. and um, he's... Uh, going to drop six out of tens as our backup attacking midfielder, then maybe Maldini's like, yeah, that's a free transfer. Let's get him in. That's depth. Did he and... play the first leg against Juve? How did he do? I didn't watch it. Well, I, I, I didn't know when he came off no. in the second, early in the second half, if not yeah, half time, I think. He, he wasn't great. But I, I, I think they had a game plan to kind of count him in a way because they know that everything goes through him. Um, he's more of an assist than goal scorer, but... I, yeah, it seems to be a real thing, a real link. Um, Fabrizio Romano said it, so it appears that he's a guy. Um, in terms of other players, Castillo's going to go, I think. Yeah, um, Kroenig probably should, goes. And he should. Uh, as you say, Dallo goes. Um, Kroenig has to go. Kroenig has to go because of Pabega. Um, Pabega is basically the same player in that he his ideal role is a box-to-box midfielder in a three, but we don't play that. So he's been crowbarred in as an attacking midfielder. But I think Pobega, when he plays further up, for Spezia, that's where he scored his goals. You know, he scored against Juve earlier this season. Um, so I, I, I'd be interested to see that. And then also it's like if if Pobega comes back, shows flashes of brilliance for the year, doesn't really fit in, a bit like Krunic now, sell him on for, for pure capital gains and we're all happy. Um, but yeah, Krunic goes for me. And then... I can't really think of anybody else that I'd be absolutely like, yes, let's get rid of. You've got the loan situation to sort out, like Lax out. He'll probably go. Conte will hopefully go to Parma on a permanent basis, just for the sake of his career, really. Duarte hopefully goes on a permanent basis. Caldara the same. And then we get some funds together to to properly reinvest in the squad. Um, 40 mil or something like that would be nice for, for the collective figure. Yeah, but then you got to look at the loans that we're going to take our options on, you know? So are we really getting any money out of those sales or is it already kind of? I think them sales pay for, for Tamari and Tenali, but I do believe the Tenali money's already been accounted for in the books. It has, yeah. costs. Um, so I think the sales pay for Tamari. Spread over four the, years. And then you get the Champions League money. Um, so I then think that reinforces three or four needed positions. It's only an yeah. extra fi- so the ten mil loans over two years for Tonali, and it's only an extra fifteen mil to make it permanent, and then bonuses are down the line. But also that fifth, the whole transfer operation has been spread over four years, so it has a limited. It's a masterstroke of a deal for a player like of a thirty-five million deal. It's an absolute masterstroke for Maldini, um, and yeah, he'll he'll absolutely stay. And then with the Tamari thing, let's see. I I find it funny that they keep coming out. Maldini came out and said it before the game today. Said. Uh, you know, we'll look at redeeming him, but it's a high figure. I'm thinking, what does that mean? Should we not be surprised when we pay it? You know, we're, we're going to pay it, and then um, it's like the statement, you know, Maldini thinks it's a high figure, but we still paid it, or is he using it to try to get leverage and ne- negotiate it lower? Which That's I think it is. is dangerous. It's so very I want dangerous. another back of Yoko. We, we should just pay it, because he's worth the money, based on what we've seen. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with trying to negotiate it for the next within the next three months but don't let it get to the point like we did with Kier when it's the day before and we don't know if we're going to buy him or not yet like if we're going to do it do it but there is room for negotiation over the next couple of months but just try getting done before the end of the season yeah I think it is going to go the Bakayoko route but I think we will get get it over the line Um, I, I really doubt we get much of a discount on him I mean you're dealing with Chelsea they, they always sell way higher than players are valued. So I think 30 is act, actually a steal for what we're getting at Tomori. We've talked about it 100 plus times, that future value of reselling an English player back to a top English club. So I think in the long run, 30 million isn't going to seem like that bad, especially if we do get the Champions League money, which I think we will at this point. Um, I, I think that's, you, you just, you got to make that deal permanent. We've talked about the potential resale value as well of Tomori, like the idea of selling him back to an English club because they're going to love the homegrown players um, with everything. Um, and there is definite potential reselling him for profit down the line. Even though I would like, it sounds like he's fully thrown himself into the experience. You know, he's learning Italian. He says that he loves the club. He's found a competitive group of players. 
Um, and he seems to already have a great rapport with all of them. So who knows? He might just he might want to stay. He might turn around and say, "Look, I don't want to come back to Chelsea, even if it is his boyhood club and stuff like that." He might he might just want to hang around. And I'm, mm-hmm. I think it would say. Well, that didn't matter with Bakayoko though. I mean, he wanted to come back for three yeah, straight that's years true. or however long it was. That's true. That is true. Um, right, next one. Um, BJ Ness, I think. I've said that wrong. Um, why doesn't Pioli like Hauger? Uh, I like that question. I would have definitely subbed him on today over Rade Krunic. Um, again, I keep thinking Hauger's a good player to bring on when we've got a lead because he's actually a pretty good defensive winger. We've seen him track back and recover the ball, um, sometimes on the edge of our box. He seems to be pretty good at that. And also, he's an energetic outlet, you know. He's not the quickest player in the league by any means, but um, in terms of eating up the clock and just taking them all to the corner, he could be pretty useful in my opinion. But uh, well, and he's notoriously reason, scored our third goal. We needed a third. Yeah, yeah. we saw that at Napoli, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, with Hauger, I don't know what the situation is. That we spoke about it before when we said maybe they just wanted to rest him for a month or two because. He hasn't had a break since June. I think they were, um, me and Isaac were talking about a stat that like he'd had, he'd played more minutes since the start of June than Kessie had up until the end of the calendar year, which is oh, phenomenal yeah. when we know how much Kessie plays. So I do think he's going to start getting his chances, but I think on the point of Diaz, why are we trying to train someone else's player when we've got a potentially better young player of our own, give him the minutes. If we have no intention of doing anything with Diaz and we need, a, you want to experiment a bit, just give Hauger the role in the number 10. Like, give him a I shot. He that. can't do any harm. And I just don't, I, I, I haven't been his biggest fan as we know, but I just think he does deserve a chance now, especially if we don't have any intentions of uh, renewing Diaz. I said that about at the time when we um, didn't have a natural number 10 about instead of playing Liao out of position, Hauger has actually played as an attacking midfielder. He played there in the second half for Bodo against us, and that's from the position where he scored that 25-yard screamer that got everybody talking about him. Um, I would have played him there, and I still would give him a game at attacking midfielder because I actually think the further wide he is, the less he affects the game. The closer to goal he is, the more he affects it. So... Why not? I don't really think that he could do much worse. Um, but yeah, I'm a bit gutted that he didn't get on today, to be honest. Uh, but we'll see. Like Udinese and Hayas Verona, perhaps on paper, are better games for him. So hopefully we'll get some game time. But otherwise, it, it starts to look like a debatable decision not to let him leave on loan um, if we aren't going to actually use him. We'll see. Um, two questions from Fossa de DIM. Um, would you? Uh, we'll quickly breeze through these. Uh, would you change Pioli next season if Milan finishes in fourth spot? This yes. is, it, uh, it depends. It I mean, if Allegri is begging to come back, like mm. nobody thinks Pioli is the long term solution. But how do you punish the guy for accomplishing what we've been trying to do for eight years? Bang on. Yeah. It's just it's just a backward step in the project. Like we need a couple of players to make this team fully work, like a new right winger, backup left back, a fourth choice centre mid that can come in and start. And I think whatever manager comes in, like if Allegri comes in, it's going to take an overhaul of a squad mm. to get the way that he wants it. And then you're sacrificing 18 months to 24 months of hard work from purely just for the sake of a manager that, yet yeah, he's won everything there is in Italy. He's done well in the Champions League with Juve, but notoriously, when you bring a manager back to the club, it doesn't work out. And I just think it's a big risk. And it's so unfair on Purely for all the hard work he's done, just to bin him off like that. It, yeah, it's enough for me. I even think if we finish outside the top four, I'd be tempted to say you keep him for another, at least another six months, maybe. Because he has done really well with his squad. If we if we finish fourth or below that, it implies there's been a bit of a slide between now and the end of the season, given yeah. that an eight point cushion now on Roma. Um, but um, 
I don't like when managers come out and constantly beat the drum of a particular statistic. Right where we are now at this very moment, we're 17 points better off than we were at this time last season. That in itself is just like, a, don't change it because we're getting, yeah. not only are we getting better, this isn't a five point growth that's got us just inside the top four or whatever. This is like massive growth, huge. So we're fighting points. for the title. Yeah, 17 points makes that difference. You know, there's a good editorial on Milan News in midweek about how um, we're so used to being 20 points off top going into March that um, that's why everything's been so overblown, you know, is that we need some kind of reactionary sensationalism because we're used to overreacting the other way at this point in time and it being so negative and us being so far off. And here we are. Yeah, I agree. Stick with him. Stick with him. I think after... If you, I said it earlier, after at the start of the season, if you said after 24 rounds, we're going to be sat second place, score points off the top, eight points clear of fourth in the round of 16, uh, the Europa League, we're going to be above Juve, Atalanta, but we're going to have a little bit of dip in form. You'd have bit the hand off. Mm-hmm. I personally would have. And then if you'd have said, and after them 24 games, we'll question purely is if he should be in charge or not. We'd have gone berserk because so I don't understand yeah. why we're even doing it. To be fair, when you, we are where we are, Milan Twitter, spot on. Um, final question, Marco Villar: uh, How many points do you think are needed for top four, and how many points will win the Scudetto this season? I'm going to give a cheeky answer here. Um, mm. The points required to win. Into. Well, I was just say one more point than whoever's in second. I mean, it, it's so up in the air. Like anything could happen at this point. There's no set number that it's going to win it, you know, even if we were to get three points from every game from here on out, that's not a guarantee we win it because we're not first. So the only, the only way to guarantee it is one more point than whoever's in second. So I based it off, there's 42 points left to play for, I believe. And I think 36 to 38 points wins us the Scudetto because I think Inter will drop the points needed in that period. Yeah, yeah. And then I think for top four, we only need about 28 points to 30. For top four, I'm not saying for second, just to qualify for the Champions League, we need 28 gonna, to 30. Look, I'm looking at last season as well, 78 points um, for fourth place. would be absolutely fine, I think, with around this mark, uh, at that mark this season. To win the league, though, you might be looking at potentially 85 to 90, which is kind of scary. Um, but, yeah. Not but sure. 36, to, 36 to 38 points for the Scudetto, like I said, that's four to six points being dropped, and you just look there at Juve and Atalanta, and maybe a draw in there. So I think that target is doable based off the start of the season. Um, the second question then: um, Should we sell Romagnoli this summer? Unless, uh, sorry, until his price drops further. Wait, say that one more time. Look, that doesn't make any sense. I didn't pre-read these questions, so we're going to have to edit this. Uh, I think what it means is, should we say Roman, Roman Yoli this summer before his performances get worse and his price drops slower considering he's got a year left on his contract? Mm. Um, I get what they're saying, yeah. Um, I, think, I say yes, but the reason I say sell him this summer has nothing to do with his valuation or his contract. It's simply because it's going to be really hard to just strip him of the armband. And I think that's going to be a key factor in getting the GGO renewal over the line. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think if we could get rid of him, that would be probably ideal. Yeah, if, I, if, if Rayo is annoyed about not being able to make any money off GGO going anywhere, then there's a client that you could take somewhere and potentially get money for. I still think there is a market for Romagnoli without a doubt, like, you don't he would fit perfectly in Lazio's system, and I'm sure he'd be happy to go there. Yeah, or even in La Liga. I keep thinking he'd look pretty good in a La Liga team, and that's maybe why like Atletico was sniff- sniffing around before. Um, yeah, I don't. Obviously, he's an Italy international, so at the end of the day, he's only 26, so there's a few more years left in the tank with him. Um, I I think we might start to see something in the next few weeks. Uh, with regards to where his future really is, if he's lost that pro- that starting spot um, to a guy who's on in theory on loan until the end of the season, it's gonna be difficult then for him to to wrestle back his Milan career, in my opinion. I think there's an option with Chelsea 
to do some sort of swap or just let's say five million in Romagnoli for Takayo. Um I just think he would be a good squad depth for next season. But the issue is to strip someone of the captain, say, or to keep him as captain rather than squad depth, it's a difficult situation. i if the right offer comes in and it meant that we kept Takaya, then yes, I'd sell him, but I'm not really now good squad depth. And I think that's what he would be. I know this contradicts what I just said as well as what you said, but we did it with Montalivo. You know, we, we just made him a reserve player. Like there was no questions about it. We just, we gave the armband to Benucci and Montalivo never saw the pitch. So, I mean, it's... I'd, I'd, like, I like, to think, that way. I'd like to think we're past that sort of thing with the management we've got, like Mirabelli and Fasoni did it, and look how it turned out with Benucci. Yeah. Were a toxic environment towards the end. Um, so I hope it wouldn't come to that. I just think if he stays, you've got to keep him as captain, really. Um, but it, I don't think he's any more than a squad player. I think in the Champions League, he just gets found out. And if he plays against Manchester United, That'll be an interesting battle to see how he fares against someone like Cavani, Rashford, Martial, Bruno Fernandes. That's going to be an interesting battle to see where he's actually at. Because if he performs in that game, then you start to think, oh, maybe he is actually that top calibre player that we wanted. Mm. Maybe there's a recovery that comes from all this. And I really hope there is. You know, there's absolutely no agenda involved at all here. Just call a spade to spade. He's in, he's in bad form at the moment. And I think he's rightly being dropped because of it. But what I hope is that what comes from this is a resurgence and that the next time he gets his opportunity, he looks sharp, refocused. Um, in a weird way, he doesn't have the pressure on him anymore because he's had the humiliation or whatever of being dropped. He's had that disappointment. That's not on his shoulder anymore. He's over it and um, he might begin to play with a little bit more freedom. That's my hope. Uh, I think he starts on Wednesday against Udinese. I think he's straight back in the lineup. I think, yeah, I have a feeling. Yeah. I think Kier might be Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, back onto the Twitter now. Uh, Teo Diplas. Uh, majority of Milan Twitter want a solid substitute for Teo so he can rest in unimportant games. And we definitely need a right winger. Um What's the latest news on Talvin? Can Brahim be a permanent replacement for Hakan or does the team need to invest in a number 10? So a few questions there. Starting with the left-back thing, um, we, I think we're going to be in the market for a new left-back. The name that it's, it keeps seeming to be is um, Matthias Vina from Palmeiras. I wouldn't be surprised if that pops up again. His player we've been after for a while. Strikes me as that kind of... 10 mil deal that we could just kind of do and and would actually be a good bit of depth. But also I wouldn't rule out us signing a player who can both uh, play both left back and right back as we've seen with with the attempt with Dallo anyway. Um, but I would like to see us um, sign perhaps a young and promising left back. Don't rule out um, Milos Kerkes having some game time between now and the end of the season because he seems to be really impressive for the Primavera. And then Kalulu becoming an actual backup right back. And then we've got Salamakis as the third choice if needed. Um, then the, the right wing position, I think it's going to be Talvin, to be honest. I like the Jonathan Icone links. I think 30 million, 40 million is out of our price range at the moment. But if the management decided we've got one area we can invest some funds um, and we decide for it to be the right wing, then a bit of pace and power. You know, some serious power behind that corner would be would be good. Attacking midfielder, no, I don't think Brahim Diaz. You, you can't risk him becoming our permanent number ten. Uh, not based on what we've seen. If he's taken to the league like a duck to water, then we could have that discussion. But he's been so up and down, and his best performances have been in the Europa League as well. Um, that I, I don't think that you, we can say we're in a position to do that. And then it becomes what happens with, with Hakan. If he stays, then we just need backup. If he goes, then we probably invest in the number 10. But those are the three main things that need addressing, definitely. I think for me, it's left back. I'd love to see DeMarco, like we just touched on earlier. I think he'd be a fantastic vice tier. Um, he, he, I just really enjoy watching him. Um, Talvin, perfect right wing solution. 
For attacking mid, if we're looking at a backup for Hakan, I'd say Pessina. He's got a bit of Champions League quality. We know we can get him at a 50% cut deal. Um, so I think that's a must. And then I, the reason why I want Tavin so much is so we can put the money elsewhere. And I think it needs to be in a striker. So like Bellotti. I like the links with Benzema. I think he'd be a good um, recruit, even if he has got two years left in him, just for the Champions League experience and what he can do as a number nine. Wages will probably be the only problem with that. But um, I've also seen the thing, I don't think it was from a great source, but, so you can take it with a pinch of salt, but the idea that Real Madrid want Brian Diaz back, so in order to sort of soften the blow for us, they'd give us first refusal on his score. Um, if his score would drop his wages, then I would absolutely... I think he's more built for, the, for Syria than Brahim. And obviously he's got that Champions League experience. So he had a really good game against Atalanta. Um, he's one of the few bright spots for Real Madrid on the night. Um, but it's just wages again. He's, he's got a big salary. I think he'd yeah, remind me a bit like... A, uh, yeah, I, have, I think he'd remind me a bit like a Depal player for Udinese. Um, I think he'd be great in that number 10 role, especially in Serie A. I wouldn't roll... See, I, I was so against it for so long. But every time I watch DePaul now, I just think to myself, God, yeah, you know, a really hard working right, right sided player could actually do a job for us um, if we could get him on favourable terms. And I don't know where he goes if it's not us, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's a role for him in Inters 3 5 2, for example. Um, I don't think there's particularly a role for him at Juve anywhere now. They've got Kiesa, Kulusevsky, all them. Who knows? We might be the right team for him. Um, but yeah, th those are definitely the three main roles to address. And the number nine thing is going to be interesting too, because I think if Ibra renews and Mandzukic gets the auto renewal from a top four finish, I don't think we're going to do anything. I think we're going to stick with those two and then Liao as a centre forward when needed. And then summer 2022, when who knows, there might be some favourable release clauses kicking around. That might be when we decide to make our big move. I just can't imagine we go into a Champions League season with Ibra and Mandzukic as our two starting strikers, I think, or um, number one and number two. If our cousins keep, you know, burning money as they are doing, we might be able to poach Lukaku at a decent price. Get them on a free. Well, apparently they did. I heard uh, Suni owes United like. 50 mil or something ridiculous, and they just liquidated the Chinese club. Who is yeah, the one who owes it? I don't know how it works. They're, but, they're yeah. in trouble. They're in trouble. Um, yeah. I heard from a, from a source who cannot be named that UEFA actually sent a delegation um, on Thursday to Milan. They, they had uh, Seferin was at the Europa League game on Thursday night between us and Red Star, and then apparently he went to um, investigate Inter's ownership situation. Which is code red, they're in deep shit if, if UEFA are having to send a delegation. And then, of course, the news comes that Sunning have folded Jiangsu. And yeah, it really doesn't look good for them, you know. Like, I yeah, keep I saying, just, they, they, they have they, that 400 odd million in, in immediate debt that needs paying in the next 18 months. Like, we're so lucky to be in a position that we're in. Four points, who gives a shit? They've spent so much money and got nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. And we're building sustainably and there's four points between us. Well, and they're going to get a point deduction if they can't pay this stuff. If I mean, if they're in as bad of trouble as they are, it's good at the season all over again. We don't even have to win it. It's just <laughs> given to us. <laughs> It'd be great to see him get a points deduction, but that is not the way that... I don't think I'd be able to celebrate the Scudetto. Knowing that we've all on, I would be yeah. shit face drunk celebrating that's good at though. I don't care at I, all. I mean, I probably would, but like morally, I'd just be like, <laughs> come on, that it, it, it's just being handed to us. That's not the way that I'd want to win it. I think if we're going to do it, I'd rather do it properly. That's how Inter got the 18. So I was going to say that's how Inter got there. Yeah, and they shamed 14, whenever it was, five. I back. think it was 13 they and 14, wasn't it? Yeah. They shamelessly celebrated it. Like, I don't want to be that club. That, like, Juventus still celebrate theirs. Like, I just yeah, don't no. want to be that. Yeah. No, I, I think that's fair. That's fair. Um, so, uh, we did talk a little bit about this, but Greg Lind says, um, should we be worried about Liao's lack of production? He's got zero goals, one assist in his last 10 appearances as far as. Uh, yeah, but look at his minutes that he's played. It's... It's not indicative of 
10 full games. Um, mm. and, and I can pull those stats up real quick, but like today he played, I believe it was like 20, maybe 30 minutes, right? Something, something like that. Nothing crazy. Yeah, um, 35. 35. And he put like 25 recently. He played a half a game against Red Star, another half in the, the other game of Red Star. So, I mean, between those four games, he's really equaling a game and a half, you know, almost two games out of four. So, and, and I could go back further and figure it out, but I, I don't think he's had a full 90 minutes in any of those 10 games. And with substitute appearances, A, you have to get up to pace with the game. You got to come in late and adapt quickly. Plus, you're limited in the amount of time you have to create. So I would argue, look at his match rating, look at his minutes. I don't, I don't know what those are, but I, I would imagine he's probably averaging like a, a who scored six or seven for the season right now. And out of, I think if we're looking at his last 10, totally he's had 15 games and I think he's on like nine goals and assists. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's up there. He's doing well. Yeah, I think like when he came on today, you know, he came on for Ibra, Hacken came off at half time, then Rebic came off not long after him. He had no service. He was trying to create it all himself. I were a bit harsh on him earlier, but like he was doing it all himself. I agree he needs to work on his end product. I think that's something that he has to do if he wants to be starting striker in a couple of years, starting left wing. But I think we do need to cut, maybe cut him a little bit of slack because he hasn't been getting a lot of game time. Do you think he was uh, perhaps hard done by not to have won a penalty? Yes. Yes, I do yeah, think that was a bad I think there was a bit of an obvious... He pushed off him, and that's for me when you get into dangerous territory as a defender because he didn't have the angle on the ball. So he was, in, he was relying on using his physicality to try and um, make sure Leal didn't have an easy finish, basically. And he just leaned in a bit too much for me. And, um, well, and he took I his challenge at the back of Leal's thigh. Yeah. And, well, so, and then there was the one that had happened at the other end with Teo where... Uh, and Mkhitaryan had gone down and they were howling for a penalty and I don't think that was, but then it would have looked really bad if they'd given the Liao one. And yeah. I thought that one was does, a penalty too, to be honest. That's um, what does yeah. my head in. Like, for me, the Mkhitaryan one, I genuinely, like by side, I don't believe it were a penalty. I think it was one of them where they were both... I don't think it was a foul yeah. on Mkhitaryan, but I don't think it was a foul on Teo. Like, they were just both at it. Whereas Leal, I think he clearly does get fouled. And this is the bit that I don't like about referees at the minute. They think that just because they haven't given something five, ten minutes ago, that then they have to do the same. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. down that's the always other been end, my gripe with something. like yellow cards as well. You know, everyone says it's like, no. that's the third penalty or third foul he's gotten away with when you get a card. And it's like when he commits a cardable offense, you know, it, it's not an accumulation. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's when they do. I know you can get a yellow card for an accumulation of offence, but it's this idea that you, you don't. It's like there's no um, exclusivity. Like you're refereeing um, every single incident that happens in a game in context with the entirety of the game that's happened before, and that's re- really dangerous. Mm-hmm. If you don't yeah, just the, do the commentator today the for the Roma game, um, Veratuk hit the referee twice with the ball. And sure. the commentator that I was watching said, he's like, oh, the, you know, referee gives a big smile, but I guarantee he cards him as soon as he gets a chance. And I'm like, it shouldn't fucking matter, you know? Like, yeah. what what do you say morale, moral-wise about the, the referee? I mean, granted, I've shit on the AIA millions of times and continue to do so, but, like, you, you can't just assume because, you know, a player accidentally hit him with the ball a couple of times he's going to card him because of that. Like, come on. I think when you referee a game, you've got to referee every incident as if it were the first minute of the exactly. match. Like, forget yeah. about what's happened. Unless it's a second bookable offence, and that's different. But things like the layout penalty call, forget what's just happened before. Forget that you've already given a penalty. If it's a penalty, it's a penalty. You don't think, oh, I've made a mistake, I need to make up for it, blah, blah, blah. You just do it. And if you have made a mistake, that's what the AR's there for. So you should be refereeing every minute of the game, every incident of the game like it's the first minute unless like I said it's the second book of all events. yeah bang on absolutely and that's been my problem with referees and it's not just in Italy it's across the board um, well my first big one is the uh, inconsistent application of VAR and then my second is just inconsistency with regards to decisions we've seen it so many times where um, you have two almost identical fouls or something and one is a yellow card and one is and, and you just think it's bad. like the Castilla yellow card towards the end. For me, that was yeah. just as bad as the Tonali red card one against Benevento. Yeah, that was a, this year. That was a 
a pretty I saw that and I thought that's cynical like mm -hmm. I thought he might have been a little bit lucky with that but it's what it is um, yeah that's it without questions boys but it's been a long one but it's been a good one it just nice to have a positive outpouring for once after what feels like you know four games we went without a goal in open play if you don't count the own goal in Belgrade um, and yeah a win under our belts Hopefully in a week's time we'll have two more ones to recap. That would be very nice indeed. We'll be smiling and again. Top of the league. Case. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be lovely. Um, but in the meantime, I've been your host, Ollie Fisher. You can find me on Twitter at Ollie Fisher or at Kilpin Chronicle. AJ. Yep, yeah, Tory 45. Yeah, at UK underscore AC Milan. And I've also got a new personal account just for a load of try, which is at Janma G I A N. N A trip N A A R R R, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, just search it; it'll be there, I'm sure. Um, yeah, and also uh, make sure to check out our shop if you haven't done already. There's a link to that on the website, or it's also on our Twitter page. Um, and and in I the description like, below. Oh yeah, subscribe, like, all that. Comment, please comment as well. We love the comment section at the moment. We've been getting more and more comments, and that is great to see. And yeah, thank you if you've made it this far, and we'll catch you in a week's time. Andrea Conti, bella palla per Rebic, Rebic Ibra, Rebic, 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 il tiro, go!